Greetings. It's amazing we've got Robin and there's no car. Yes, I do. No Omega either. Um, Omega is working today and then she is going to go off and partying because she's just about finished university stuff. And uh, so Robin's here. Yay. Trapped with me and films. And hungover. <laughs> so we just watched. Where is the title? Where Blackbirds Fly. There you go. This is the second film by Jimmy Screamer Claus, a.k.a. Mr. Whether Day I Gonna Die, yep. who sent me this lovely Labby the Dog from Whether Day I Gonna Die t-shirt. <laughs> he actually sent me the film a few months ago, along with that t-shirt and a bunch of other interesting things, including the Puppet Oddities, like a short thing, and a bunch of discs and stuff. A whole lot of stuff. Ah. A lobby sticker. Mr. Skipper Claus knows who his friends are when black words fly. But um, yeah, Mr. Skipper Claus. Um, after I did the word that I gonna die review, he um, we got in contact with each other. He liked the review. Um. And, but out of my review, <laughs> the myth that he intended whether I go to, go to die as a comedy sort of grew. I, that was my fault. He, because uh, I found out later on, I'd misinterpreted something he'd said in the director's commentary. And what he actually intended was for the first story to be a, a pitch black comedy and the rest to be a drama. And so now everyone thinks that he, <laughs> that it's meant to be a comedy. And it's not. He, he still gets shit over that, so, you know, again, sorry, Jimmy. But we talk to each other occasionally. We've uh, had him a lesbian talk. He's a really nice guy, and he sent me this. And actually, I was almost a voice actor in this. Um, basically, he was at the very end of getting voices for, his, for the film after I did my review, and he sent me a message saying that, you know, if you want to do, like, random screams and whatnot, I can put them into the, review, into the film. And basically, I was incredibly... Uh, hard for time then. I, I wasn't able to record them for him in time, so I'm not in the film. So if you're watching this, Jimmy, please give me a proper role. Give me a role of uh, any kind. I'll, I'll play like random stupid person. But you know, your next film. So it'll play be Lobby Jr. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Haggy. <laughs> but, but this one. Honestly, having seen these two back to back, I think this is a fantastic film compared to Whether They Go to Die. Now, Whether well, They Go to Die. one film, it's not three. Yeah. Whether They Go to Die, um, it's really hard to judge as a piece of art because it is so uncomfortable to watch. Basically, it does things with your mind. Now, this does the same sort of thing of just disassociativeness and sort of feeling a little bit, a little bit hypnotic, and you're sort of, it washes over you. You find yourself at some point unable to really think about it if it goes on for too long because it just keeps coming. But this one, it does it a little bit less to make it easier to judge as a work of art. And I thought it was phenomenal. Well, it was a very enjoyable film. It was better than what I was expecting. Yeah, you were all like, I'm not watching that. And I'm like, I gotta watch it. Omega will not watch She refuses to watch it because she's terrified of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a... Uh... It's a good dystopian story. There's a followable plot. I've got three comparisons to other stories I want to make, but I can save them for this bit of the review. And you should be louder because the camera is very far away. I'm sorry. I'm very tired, and I hypnotized myself at some point during that film. <laughs> but, Jimmy, it's no, no comment onto yourself. I did fall asleep. That's because I'm tired. <laughs> But the bits of the film I did see, which is about 90%, <laughs> I did actually enjoy watching. Your animation style has improved much more compared to the first film. It's not what I would call traditionally uh, perfect with the current perfection culture we have in the animation community. But it's a lot more watchable than where the dead go to die. Uh, and it's very interesting. I did not fall asleep. That means my opinion is more important. <laughs> Okay, basically, what you've got is uh, 
a hellscape dystopia, very strange for the guy who did Whether Dead or Gonna Die, mm -hmm. which is very, very black and white. It's very religious. You've got this god guy called Cain who's in charge. You, for the longest time, I assumed it was a fictional character, and they just used him as a figurehead like Big Brother. But no, he's actually a real guy, and he looks a bit like Stan Lee if he was much younger. And um, he, they got this wall around their, their town, and they're, he's telling them never to leave the wall. Of course, you know. At least one Attack on Titan joke was made, because I had to watch that recently, thanks uh, for a patron. And That's quite good. I had to watch the live-action films. Oh, and they're not good. I went in blind. I was just like, okay. <laughs> I do not understand this. Colin and Nicola were very angry. Um, they're not good. Uh, okay, and outside it, though, is this technicolor thing of madness and hedonism, and basically all of the nightmares of extremely religious insular communities. If you've, you've watched Magic and and you can picture in your head what the witch realms look like, it's that, but in more CGI-y stuff. Yeah, it, yeah the, you showed me a couple of clips, and it was, yeah, really, really similar comparison. Though, um, when you're trying to come up with something that looks happy, bright, and also terrifying, there's very few rough areas you can go into. Yeah. So. Not surprised there's a, an Oh, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying they look somewhere. So, um, outside you've got this woman who, uh, it seems to be a cross between Lilith and Asherah from a <clears throat> pre-Christian uh, biblical sort of stuff. You know, the, the, the Jewish part of the, of the, the creation Mythos. story. Yeah. Like, well, well, Asher is actually pre-Jewish. She was part of the old pantheon of the Hebrew pantheon before they got rid of all of the rest of them and replaced them all with uh, Yahweh, who I can't remember if he was a volcano god or a war god or a storm god. But they chose one god to remain and the rest of them were got rid of. And Asher was traditionally um, Yahweh's wife. And so she seems to be a cross between those two things. And she's there sort of crucified and everyone's sort of having like psychic sex with her. And there's a bunch of animal human hybrids running around and people like they eat fruit and it basically gives them a horrible form of enlightenment it gives them insight actually they grow eyes which yeah is an enlightenment that's insight okay sorry and then they turn they also turn into the animal human hybrids is because flesh is not real it's malleable and people start off as these sort of maggoty caterpillar type things like muppet caterpillars they were so adorable i want one of them yeah, if they were less hellish. No, no, they were awesome. I'd hang them from a wall. It'd be great. <laughs> so we should do it with a noose. <laughs> okay, so this little kid who was like the runt of the litter in this maggoty sort of uh, caterpillar thing. Because in order to get a kid, you got to go into this alternate dimension, which seems to be connected to the outside of the wall place, and choose one of these pipe cleaner looking things, and then it gets turned into a child. And so these parents do that, they get themselves a child, and this kid is the main character. And it is really hard to explain what happens in this film without A, watching it about five more times, and B, taking a long time. It's less confusing than Whether than whether I Go to Die, but it's still really, it's really esoteric. And I'm sure there is a million and one references to various religious things that I'm missing. But, because, you know, Screamer Claws loves putting references to things in. That's very high concept. Yeah, yeah. And I fucking loved it. So, uh, what was the other question? Yeah, I kept getting... I don't know if this is in any way intentional, or if it's just, you know, dystopias are all becoming the same thing in my head now. But I kept getting freaking flashbacks to the NSP music video for 6969. Especially whenever Cumblood's character, the police people were talking, they were going through these vocoders. Yeah, there's one of the policemen was voiced by somebody named Cumblood, by the way. That's awesome. Probably a musician. I would say so. But it was going through some vocoder, and it just reminded me of, uh, like I said, the NSP music video for 6969, which takes place in a, month, in a future dystopia where sex has been completely outlawed and you're not allowed to see each other naked, and there's these uh, dick elders, as they're referred to, who go around talking like the same sort of voice, being like, no sex. Right. Sounds like Zardoz. Yeah. Because that sort of thing happens there too. But it was just the overall aesthetic, I think. Not not visual aesthetic, but... You Use your words. Parse them. 
the sound design of certain characters was very similar to sound design of other certain characters from a similar setting that I've experienced in the past. Good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and uh, oh, my favourite little moment. The, the very start, they're going to the church in order to, before doing the ceremony to be able to get their child. The fucking child who fucks Labby in Whether They're Gonna Die is sitting in one of the pew in the pews, and I'm just like, ah, oh, I can't remember the name of the kid, but I like that. Good work. I was hoping there would be other little uh, bits to Whether They're Gonna Die, and but there might have been, but I didn't really spot any. Like there's reuse of some animation concepts, like uh, bits where the hair was going mad with the Tina Turner woman, like the little uh, maggoty, furry Muppet baby things. They use that. Um, and there's a lot of eyeballs everywhere, and there's a lot of animal-human hybrid sex with corpses, but, you know, it's a Screamer Claws thing. That's gonna happen. He could act, He could totally make a biopic of um, Mother Teresa's life, and she would have sex with a half-dead centaur. I fucking bet. That's in her autobiography, of course. She's gonna include it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Wait, does that kind of libel? No, she's uh, dead. Oh, fair enough. No, as okay. I understand it, she's, uh, she's in the public domain now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awful. No, it's actually... Not really, she was a cunt. Oh, well, yeah. She also is a saint who had no faith. Yeah. Which, she... regardless of whether you are a believer or not, is kind of fucked up. She... There's a lot of nasty stuff about her. But, um... See, this is a really hard film to vlog about because it's not like it can be like, you see this bit, there's this bit with this guy that did something stupid and it was fucking hilarious. I can't really do that because... Is it trying to vlog about the last five episodes of Evangelion? Yeah. It's just twisted around itself and... Yeah, and if people do stupid things, it's kind of, it makes more sense in the world because the world is... Fucked up. It's, yeah, it's not like ours, so it doesn't... So the basic rules of how people should act don't really apply. So it's hard to criticize on that level. I mean, you know, like my uh, Whether I Go to Die review, if, um, where basically I, dis I explain what's happening in a small amount of words as possible, and then I spend the rest of the time just trying to point out the weirdness of what's going on in these little pieces. I could do a lot of that. I mean, I am going to add this to my review pile, but going from memory and trying to explain it, it doesn't quite work. Lend itself to that. Yeah. It'll be, real, it'll be a spectacular review, though. One more question that really stuck out to me, and this is just going into that little tiny things that are odd. I was wondering if the characters didn't actually have genitals because of a... because of the world they're in where basically sex has been outlawed and doesn't exist in there. Well, after you fell asleep, there was a bit... You, you saw flashbacks to the first humans, and I'm pretty sure I saw some genitals. So you're probably right about that. Excellent. Because, yeah, everyone, everyone in the future, in the inside you know, the religious society, everyone's like uh, Barbie dolls. Yeah. And uh, so one of the subplots is that there's a, this woman, she swallows this fruit from the outside, and she's going to give birth to the Antichrist, even though other people swallowed it, and they never gave birth to the Antichrist. Um, so she's writhing on the floor. But it's basically like a chest burster scene from Alien, and she's sort of like she's tearing her clothes off because there's something inside her trying to get out. And she's like, ah, oh, no, help me. And her husband's like, oh, no, I can't see you naked and runs off. And so they eat a bunch of ice cream while she's sitting in the other room screaming her, her head off in pain. And it is really funny. Which was actually foreshadowed in a couple of signs earlier. Mm -hmm. Whenever life gets too much, eat ice cream. Yeah, it's very clever. And, but then uh, in order to get the Antichrist, you know, to birth it, you know, the, the husband has to basically take a big knife and cut it out of her. And then, of course, the uh, the military come in because they heard a report that she was naked. And so, like, they had to confirm that she was naked. We've had a report that you've been naked in the privacy of your own house. If this is true, this is an exilable offence. Is this true? She's there naked, covered in blood. <laughs> Some wonderful bits of of, uh, of satire there. Thank you very much. Jimmy, scream your claws. She has an exit wound between her legs. <laughs> Yeah, the hilarious bit of the Antichrist sort of crawling away, covered in blood, while the naked, bloody dad is chasing after it, trying to grab it. <laughs> I, still, I swear, this is like the darkest episode Benny Hill ever made. I still think that the best satire in it was whenever God created the first creatures with their glass fishbowl heads, and they just all had up the blue screen of death <laughs> saying, Soul not found. <laughs> that was brilliant. 
and God is basically this sort of uh, male looking figure with no genitals who's naked has a big glass head with and six arms yeah six arms and he has a crown but he's also got a crown of thorns attached to it it's just like oh that's great I like that visual I mean it's it's better than the Jesus visual from whether I go to die which was G uh, big man sort of crucified but his head was replaced by the sun because it's like you know I heard you like sun so I put some sun in your son of God so you can sun while you son of God I like the idea of uh, <laughs> God creating things, getting bored, creating more things, getting bored and fucking off. That's very deistic. Don't have, don't have deistic, because deistic is, it's sort of like I don't think there's a concept for a neutral, a truly neutral God. I mean, deistic is like one that doesn't give a shit, but this one, this one, it does give a shit or it doesn't give a shit depending on how he's feeling. So it's like a maltheistic one, uh, or th or theistic one, you know, likes. Uh, oh, but one who can go between the two. I don't think there's a the, the term for that. We need to have a term for a god who is... Who's sometimes a dick, but sometimes not. No, I'm just a term for a god who's just like... Sometimes has the energy to give a crap, but sometimes is like... Oh, shiny thing over there. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know what you would call that. Authistic? Why authistic? I don't because know. Because he's authoring everything? I don't know. I'm oh, well, I, I, oh, I'm sorry for assuming that you, you knew what you were talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm trying I'm to think of clear. things that sound interesting. <laughs> Tinthistic. You know, these words, when they put them in front of theistic, it usually has some sort of a meaning. Really? Yeah. I didn't know how language worked. <sighs> Distracted by shiny things, there's a tin over there, tin, tinistic. But, yeah, this is a short one, but um, I'm sure I'll think of more things I really wish I'd pointed out because it is an outstanding piece of work. It, it's not for the faint of heart, especially if you find my Whether I Go to Die review hard to watch. Um, though, though, you know, honestly, if you only watch my review and you're freaked out, oh, you need to be freaked out less, dude. There's so much worse things than just in the review. I mean, I black boxed everything. The review didn't freak me out, but it made me sure I didn't want to watch the film. Fair enough. That that's a fair enough, you know, conclusion to come to. But you know, being freaked out by the black boxes, it's like, oh no. <laughs> Can I come up with a name for fear of black boxes? There probably is one already. Yeah. Hagnophobic. No, that's just <laughs> But this is a great. Thank you so much, Jimmy Screamer Claus. I'm really looking forward to your next one. I mean, if this one, if your next one is as high above this one as whether I go to die it was above, if the next one is as high above this as this is above whether I go to die, it's going to be really spectacular. I really want to, I'm curious to see where your career goes next. I really enjoyed this movie and I would like to watch the next one, whatever it is. Also, Adam Brooks is in it. Just a cameo, but Adam Brooks, a.k.a. Dr. Scorpius, from Manborg. There's a C-list actor doing C-list acting jobs? He's hardly C-list. He's more like E-list, because he's, you know, a cult, 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 cult Canadian actor. But still, he's, well, he's one of the stars of Father's Day. And the editor, he played the titular editor in The Editor. Oh, he's fucking brilliant. I love Adam Brooks. Oh, such a weird... Fandom. <laughs> Mindset. See you. See you later. Bye. Turn off. <laughs> <laughs>